None of us can really know when tragedy will strike and change our lives forever. It could be a car accident, a sudden crippling disease, or some other unforeseen traumatic event. But it is especially tragic when we are with our loved ones on a vacation and the unexpected and unthinkable happens. This is what happened to Amy Lynn Bradley, who was one such person that vanished at sea. There are many mysterious disappearances at sea, and the majority of those lost people fade into obscurity, a mere footnote in the history of unexplained vanishing travelers. But the families of those people don't forget, living with the tortured questions that may never be answered. And in Amy's case, her story has lived on with the general public, many of whom still wonder what really happened on that fateful day. Amy and her family were on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship on the way to Curacao, a popular Dutch Caribbean island destination. The trip was a celebration of Amy's recent college graduation and of her plans to start a new job with a computer consulting firm. When Amy and her parents, along with her younger brother, Brad, boarded the Rhapsody of the Seas cruise ship in March of 1998, I'm sure they were looking forward to an enjoyable vacation and didn't anticipate danger of any kind. After all, this was a reputable cruise line and thousands of people sailed on this very ship every year, right? This assumption turned out to be tragically wrong because in the early morning hours of Monday, March 24th, Amy simply vanished. Earlier in the evening, Amy and her brother Brad headed to a Mardi Gras party on the ship to dance and party the night away with other passengers. Amy also socialized with the band, the Blue Orchid, and danced with one of the band members. The band member's name was Alistair Douglas, but most knew him by the nickname Yellow. A man taking videos that night captured Amy dancing with Yellow, and she seemed to be enjoying herself with her new friend. Yellow would later claim that he left the party about 1 a.m. The cruise ship electronic door record showed that Brad returned to their cabin much later, at approximately 3.35 a.m. Amy returned approximately five minutes later, according to the same electronic surveillance. Brad recalled that they talked for a few minutes out on the balcony of their cabin, and then Brad went to bed, and Amy went to sleep on a lounge chair on the balcony. Somewhere around 5.15 a.m., Amy's father, Ron, woke up and went to check on Brad and Amy. Ron reported that he saw Amy sleeping on the balcony lounge chair. Her father went back to sleep, but woke up again at 6 a.m. and realized that Amy was no longer on the balcony. He also noticed that her cigarettes and lighter were missing. Not wanting to alarm his wife, Ron left the cabin and looked around the common areas of the ship to see if he could locate his daughter. When his search failed to find Amy, he returned to the cabin at 6.30 a.m., woke up his wife and son, and told them she was missing. I can't even imagine what that was like. Here was a family on a happy, pleasant vacation that suddenly turned dark and ominous. What happened to Amy? Most cruise ship disappearances are easily explained by people accidentally falling or being pushed overboard. That seems to be the most likely explanation, considering the majority of victims were intoxicated at the time of the disappearance. Suicide, homicide, these are the usual suspects. But Amy Bradley? What do we really know about Amy? Well, she was born on May 12, 1974, in Petersburg, Virginia. She attended Longwood University, graduating with a degree in physical education. She had a scholarship in basketball and was known for her strong swimming abilities. She had also worked as a lifeguard. So she was an athlete. It seemed unlikely she fell overboard and drowned. Amy's family immediately reported she was missing to the crew of the ship, and her parents were upset that the other passengers were allowed to disembark the ship around 7.30 a.m. as scheduled. They believed it made it much more difficult to find out if Amy had met with foul play. Finally, after a majority of passengers left the ship, the crew made an onboard announcement requesting that Amy Bradley report to the front desk. Minutes, 
Then hours ticked by, still no Amy. By noon, the crew began a full search of the ship. Several hours later, after being unable to locate Amy, the Netherlands Coast Guard was notified and they began a search of the surrounding waters. Authorities speculated that she may have fallen overboard and drowned, but investigators rejected that theory since Amy was a strong swimmer and also no body was found. But then a string of witnesses appeared saying that they saw Amy after the time she was reported missing. On the morning of the disappearance, two passengers told Amy's father, Ron, they saw a woman with cigarettes and a lighter matching Amy's description, taking an elevator to the ship's upper deck. However, this story turned out to be a dead end. Another witness was a cab driver on the island that said a woman matching Amy's description approached him saying she urgently needed a phone. This sighting was never confirmed by authorities. Then, in August 1998, five months after her disappearance, a Canadian computer engineer claimed to have seen Amy walking with two men on a beach in Curacao. The witness noticed that the woman was constantly trying to get his attention until he lost sight of her at a nearby cafe. The woman's tattoos were reportedly identical to Amy's and the man said he was two feet away from her and he was absolutely certain it was her. Again, nothing ultimately came from this report. In January 1999, a U.S. Navy officer claimed to have seen a woman who claimed to be Amy Bradley at a brothel in Curacao. He said she told him that her name was Amy Bradley and she begged him for help, explaining that she was being held against her will and was not allowed to leave. He said he did not report the incident earlier since he was worried it might damage his Navy career if he admitted to being in a brothel. The witness only contacted Amy's family after he retired and saw her picture in a magazine. Additional investigation of this man's claims also turned up nothing. There was another potential sighting in 2005 when a witness claimed to have seen Amy in a department store restroom in Barbados. She claimed a woman entered the restroom accompanied by three men who were threatening her if she did not follow through on some kind of deal. She said that after the men left, the distraught woman said her name was Amy and that she was from Virginia. Then the men came back and took her away. The witness called authorities and they created sketches of the three men and the woman based on her account. This report was yet another dead end. Probably the most disturbing news was when Amy's parents reported that an image of a young woman resembling their daughter was emailed to them suggesting that she might have been sold into sexual slavery. The email was sent to the Bradley family website and contained two photographs of a woman that closely resembled Amy. The pictures were seen by a member of an organization that attempts to find victims of sex trafficking. The woman in the photo appeared to be distraught and despondent and was a sex worker known as Jazz. Yet again, no solid lead came from this evidence. Then, in a truly bizarre turn of events, Amy's parents received an email from a Navy SEAL soldier, a man by the name of Frank Jones. Frank told the family that he was a former U.S. Army Special Ops officer with a team of experienced soldiers who might be able to rescue Amy. He claimed that his team had seen Amy being held by heavily armed Colombian personnel in a housing complex surrounded by barbed wire. The team also gave an accurate description of Amy's tattoos and sang the lullaby that Amy's mother used to sing for Amy. Over the next few months, Frank would feed news to the family and provided reports on sightings of their daughter. When Jones told them that they were going to attempt a rescue, he added that he needed more money. The Bradleys sent Jones a total of $210,000 to fund the setup for Amy's search and was expecting a call from Jones and his team for the results of the rescue mission. Tragically, Jones had made up the story and tried to scam the Bradleys out of money. Later that year, federal prosecutors in Richmond charged him with defrauding the Bradleys of over $25,000 and the National Missing Children's Organization of $187,000. 
Jones pleaded guilty of mail fraud and was sentenced to five years in prison. What kind of person plays on the emotions of a desperate family in such a sick and tragic way? Another incident involved finding a jawbone that washed ashore in Aruba in 2010. At first, it was thought to be the jawbone of another missing person, Natalie Holloway, who had gone missing on Aruba. But once it was determined the jawbone was not Natalie Holloway, authorities didn't do any additional testing, despite the fact that there were at least nine other people missing from Caribbean vacations. No DNA testing was done on the material. They say the bone is human and was likely from a Caucasian. Questions still remain about some of the crew staff and band members on the night of Amy's disappearance. One suspicion is that the band member called Yellow had something to do with her vanishing from the ship. This is because he told several different stories about his whereabouts that night that could not be confirmed. There was also a waiter that may have been involved since he repeatedly tried to get Amy to meet him for drinks after dinner. Professional photographers had also taken pictures of passengers on the cruise to sell at their kiosk on the ship. Amy's picture had been taken multiple times according to the family, but were missing from the photographer's collection. Did someone steal those pictures to cover their tracks? No one knows. With all leads exhausted and no new witnesses coming forward, Amy Lynn Bradley was declared legally dead on March 24, 2010, 12 years after her disappearance. The FBI is currently offering a reward of up to $25,000 for any information that could potentially lead to the recovery of Amy Lynn Bradley or leads to an arrest or conviction of the person or persons responsible for her disappearance. On top of this, the family is awarding $250,000 for information leading to her safe return, and the family also has a reward of $50,000 for information leading to her current location. After all the bizarre twists and turns of this story, it's really hard to know what to believe. Did Amy Bradley die on that ship? Or was she the victim of organized sex trafficking? And why wasn't additional DNA testing done on the human jawbone that washed ashore in Aruba? Will her family ever get answers and the closure they so desperately need? And will any of us really know what happened to Amy Lynn Bradley? <laughs>